Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you making wise decisions? Our lives are a culmination of the decisions we make. And it all begins with one decision. What do we do with God? Do we receive him as the word of God reveals him? Do we submit to him as the word of God calls us to do? And do we walk with him in this world in a public manner? It's only when we are committed to the things of God, having a pleasing testimony before him and doing his work, then and only then are we going to be placed in a position whereby we can make wise decisions. And when one rejects God, that will begin a series and a continuation of very unwise, poor decisions that bring about disaster in one's life. Well, with that said, take out your Bibles and look with me to the book of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7. In this chapter, we see once more a prophecy of judgment, first upon the city of Damascus, one of the chief cities in this period of time, one of the oldest cities and one of the most significant cities. And then after God's words to Damascus, we're going to see that God has equally harsh words for Israel specifically that northern kingdom. And for Israel, why are they receiving that? Because they chose to follow after false gods. They chose to be like the other nations. And because of their idolatry, because of their turning away from scriptural revelation, we see that little by little, and then stronger and stronger, God's punishment is placed upon them. And that little by little, stronger by stronger, is for one purpose, to bring Israel to repentance. Here's a biblical truth. You cannot study the scripture, and it doesn't matter what book you're looking at. Nearly every book in the Bible has this, this aspect of repentance. And if we're not teaching repentance, if we're not teaching turning away from sin, then we are not sharing the truth of Messiah. When we look at the gospel accounts, we see so frequently he speaks about sin, the dangers and the disasters that come from not producing fruit worthy of repentance. So with that said, look with me as I said to the book of Isaiah, and now we're ready for that 17th chapter. It begins with the first word, a burden. Just like we saw earlier and two weeks ago, this burden that was placed upon Moab. And now that same word being used for a weight, that which brings stress, pressure, anxiety, and punishment to a people. Now this burden is against, as we read in verse 1 of chapter 17, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus, and the next word is Musar. It has to do with being removed, being caused to be no more, to be taken away from where you were and what you were and placed in an entirely different condition. So this is the burden to Damascus. Behold, Damascus is removed from a city, meaning that it's going to cease for a moment, 
from being a city that has normal city functions. God's judgment is going to cause Damascus to cease to be a normal place of habitation where the normal things of life goes on. No, God's judgment is going to bring about disaster. It is going to cause it to cease to be what it was. And instead of being a city of prominence, it's going to be a city of shame. Once more, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is removed from a city. For, for she shall be a heap of falling. Now, most Bibles will say a heap of ruins. This last word in the Hebrew text, the word mapala, has to do with that which is caused to fall. So it's fine if we have this concept of ruins. The word for heap is also the word for intestines. And what it's saying here, if you look at intestines, I mean, it is a, a mess of an organ. And this is what God is revealing concerning Damascus, this city of prominence, this city of glory, human glory, one that had an order to it, that was a city of produce, meaning of commerce. Much was accomplished because of Damascus. It was a powerful city. And now because of God's judgment, it is going to be removed from its former glory into a heap of, of stones and materials that were, were hurled to the ground. And what else does it say about this city? Look on to, to verse 2. Azuvot, are, R-O-L. The word here, azuvot, means to be abandoned, to be left it's the idea of being inhabited no more. And what's this? The cities of, of R-O-L. Now, R-O-L, there's a city of Moab called by this name. But if you look carefully at the root, see, is this the cities of? That would make this word here, R-O-L, having to do with a a region, the cities of a region. But I would argue that that instead of relating to this city that was in Moab or a city that shared the same name that was in the, the Assyria region, I would say that this word, if you look carefully, it can be the word for loneliness or being abandoned, having no activity, no fellowship, no social aspects to it. And this is the right way to understand verse 2, that her cities are going to be abandoned, they are going to be alone, and who's going to dwell there? Notice the next word, adarim. This is a word for flocks or herds, whether we're talking about sheep or whether we're talking about rams or whether we're talking about uh, uh, ibexes, we're speaking about a place, a habitation, not for people, but for animals. And they shall lie down, they shall find rest there. Ve'en machri, meaning there is nothing or no one that, that fears, that causes these animals to be fearful. Now, we know something. We know that when there's a lack of human activity, animals come into the city but when a city is bustling and has much activity and people moving about and such the animals leave depart they're far away from human activity so this just speaks how the city is going to be desolate it's going to be removed of human activity and become a place that animals find a home that they lie down and rest and no one scares them Keep reading, verse 3, and the, the stronghold. Now, this is word nipsar, and it's like a citadel. It is a, a, a castle that is strong and oftentimes that houses soldiers. So this stronghold 
of, of Ephraim is going to cease. Now, what is this speaking of? Realize, and we have saw this earlier on in the book of, of Isaiah, we've seen that there's a relationship between Aram, that is uh, uh, Syria, and also that northern kingdom, Israel. And this judgment of Damascus because, as we've learned, the northern tribes, these northern nine plus tribes, now we always hear ten. And this just shows a carelessness. And that's why I'm very, very uh, uh, specific in the words that I, I try to use. Because we know that there were 12 tribes of Israel. And each of these 11 tribes, not 12, 11 had an inheritance, an allotment of land that they were given, that they were supposed to inhabit. Nine of them were in the northern kingdom that was called Israel after the division that took place after the days of Solomon. Two were in the southern region known as Judah. And we're speaking here about the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. But then we have the tribe of the Levites, Levi. And the Levites had no inheritance of land. God was their unique inheritance serving him. And therefore, they lived throughout both kingdoms. And that's why we say nine plus, to be more accurate, the nine tribes plus a portion of the tribe of Levi. And this northern kingdom, they sided, they had an alliance with Damascus, with what we call Aram. And because of that and its destruction, Aram, Israel also suffered. And that's why it says here that the stronghold of Ephraim will cease and also the kingdom, the kingdom from Damascus. So we see the cause of effect because the kingdom of Damascus is no more. Therefore, will also stop this, this stronghold of Ephraim. And the rest of Aram, the rest of Assyria, as the kavod. Now, kavod usually means glory. But when you do a good study of some of the ancient commentators, they will point out that oftentimes, from a, a human standpoint, the word kavod, glory or honor, can be related to uh, Osher, which is wealth. And what this may be speaking about is the northern kingdoms, what's called here the children of Israel, that uh, it is also going to lack its wealth. Much of the poor decisions that the northern kingdom made in making this alliance, this agreement, this, this confederacy with Aram was for the purpose of wealth. For, for earning greater income. And now we're going to see that that is cut off. And it says at the end of, of verse 3, Yehiyu neum Hashem tzavot. This is going to be because the Lord has spoken, the Lord of hosts. So God speaks and this is the outcome of his word. That we're going to see that this confederacy between Aram, the capital city, Damascus, and that northern kingdom, Israel, is going to leave both of them. They did it for what they thought was their best interests. But it ended, out, ended up bringing about their demise. Let's move now to verse 4. In verse 4, we have a, a another heading. Where in the beginning of chapter 17, it was the burden of Damascus. Now we see that there's going to be a judgment upon Israel. And the correlation is just what we've said. This judgment that's going to be upon Israel is because of what they agreed to with Damascus. And that was to be against Judah. To lose sight of their call. To lose a, a faithfulness to the word of God. They ceased going to Jerusalem. They ceased worshiping the God of Israel. And this is going to be the basis for this judgment. Now, here again, this judgment 
does not look so much to the future, but in our days, it's already happened. With the destruction of, of Samaria in 722 BC. And we see that this was brought about by another enemy, one that was greater than Aram, Assyria, and this was uh, uh, Ashur. Now, in one sense, we should, to be more accurate, speak about uh, uh, Aram as Syria and Ashur as Assyria. Now, at one time, we know that Ashur, Assyria, included Aram. The Assyrian Empire was very, very vast. But uh, here we see that the one who's going to be bringing this judgment upon Aram, Syria, and upon the northern tribes, Israel, is literally Ashur, which is properly referred to as Assyria. Look now to verse 4. We're going to see that uh, three times in this last remaining section of chapter 17, we're going to see that the term Beyom Hahu is mentioned, judgment. And one of the implications is this. We can see that God's judgment in the past foreshadows, it teaches that his judgment in the future will happen. Whenever that phrase, and I have said this often, whenever that phrase, Beyom Hahu, in that day appears, what should, should come into our mind? That that phrase, Beyom Hahu, should, should cause us to think about judgment. Verse 4. And it shall come about on that day, Yidal. Yidal, we've come across this word in, in other places. The word Dal has to do with impoverished. It has to do with someone who has a, a meager amount of resources. So it's to be made poor. And that's what he's saying here. On that day, because of God's judgment, the, the glory of this again, this can mean glory, honor, or wealth of, of Jacob is going to, to be brought low. It's going to be meager. It's going to be, he's going to be impoverished. And from the fatness of his flesh. So he was fat, meaning he had a lot of, of things. And now we see the word for being thin that he is going to be made thin, become thin. So there's a lessening. For a time, this, this confederacy, this alliance with, with the north, with Aram, Syria, it brought about wealth, but it was a temporal wealth. He made decisions that were reinforced from the outcome, but here again, all of that serves as a deceit. Many times people make a poor decision to do something, do something wrong, and instead of being punished, they receive prosperity. And that's an encouragement to do it again and again and again. And the longer that judgment, the longer that the consequences are, are prolonged, what happens? When that judgment does come, it's more serious. And that's exactly what we see with these northern kingdom, that northern kingdom, these tribes. The fatness that they once enjoyed, now they're going to be made thin, verse 5. And this is the description of Israel, those northern tribes in, in the period before the destruction and up to the destruction of their kingdom. It says... And he will be as one that gathers the harvest from the stock. Now this stock is going to be harvested and it's going to be left bare. And that's what it's saying here. He's going to be like that stock that is harvested, that is left bare. Secondly, he says, and his arms as the ones of the, the harvester that takes this the ears of the, the stock, if we're speaking about corn, or whether we're talking about wheat, taking the, the, the grain from it. So it's going to be full, but he doesn't hold on to it. The one who harvests doesn't hold on for it forever. 
He's full, but then he lets go of it. And this is what it's personifying here. That there's going to be a time of prosperity, but it's going to become to an end. To be brought to nothing in the same way that one who is loaded down with the harvest drops it. He gives it to the owner. So this is what's going to happen. And it shall be as the gleaning of the ears, that ears of corn, as in the, the valley of Rephaim. Now, Rephaim, that word has to do with, with ghosts. Now, not literally with ghosts, but the expression we've all heard about a ghost town. Well, in Hebrew, we have the phrase, emek Rephaim. And what it speaks about is simply the area that was southwest of Jerusalem. And it was a good land. I live very near this. I live southwest of Jerusalem. And there's much good land there. But because of the Philistines, because of that enemy, for many, many years, it wasn't inhabited. It was like a, a ghost town, an area that was abandoned. And that's what he's saying here. He's using terminology that the people would certainly understand. Verse 6. And it will remain with him just the o leilot, which are the scraps. Instead of this wealth, this prosperity, all the, the good times that they enjoyed in disobedience to God, in the end, they're simply going to have scraps. And then he uses the phrase, K no kef zayat. Zayat is an olive, olive tree. And one of the ways that you get the olives is that you beat the tree, the branches, and the olives fall from it on the ground. And so this is the imagery that he's using. That, that the northern kingdom is going to be beaten and shaken. And it's all going to come tumbling down for others. And there's going to be two or three uh, uh, grains. This is two or three, what's probably referring to here, olives in the head of Amir. Amir is a common Hebrew name, but it speaks about the, the, the best, best place of the tree, the tops of the tree, the treetops. And it says that up there, there's only going to be two or three olives left. This was a place of fruitfulness. Likewise, it says, and four or five in the, the chief branches that were fruitful, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. So even though there was much wealth, prosperity, as an olive tree is full of olives, when we look at the, the best place of the olive tree, the amir, the tops of the tree, or those fruitful branches, we find there's going to be very little that remains. That Israel's judgment is going to leave them in desolation. That's what he's saying here. Verse 7. The second time that this phrase appears, beyom hahu. In that day, the man, he will look concerning his maker. And his eyes will gaze upon the Holy One of Israel. Now, verse 7 tells us something that's very important, and that is this. God's judgment to Israel is not for their eternal destruction. This is a principle that individuals need to understand. See, those who teach the falsehood of replacement theology, they, they don't do sufficient research and study of prophecy. They, they rip prophecy from its context and they, they stop reading. They only like, and this is why that I say that these individuals that, that have such a theology that says the church replaces Israel, that God's finished with the Jewish people, the land has no more significance, that that Old covenant has no future consequences, that God has forgotten it, that he has made it, rendered it void and, and of null effect. Well, there's verses that hint towards that. But here's the problem. As you keep reading, you see a change. God has these harsh statements. 
And then after concluding them, it says something to the effect that God is merciful. And he will look again. And it's always a last day context. He will look again with mercy. And he will remember the patriarchs. He will remember his promises. And for the sake of his name, for a testimony of his faithfulness, his graciousness, his mercy, his compassion, he will renew these promises. When? In the last days. They never, ever read that. They, they, they devoid their theology of all of these verses. And it's not by accident. It's not because they haven't read them, but they ignore them because such prophecy goes against their preconceived ideas. And what is the basis of these preconceived ideas? It's a hatred for Israel. It is an anti-Semitic spiritual condition that they have. And this needs to be exposed. This needs to be spoken against. And, and we frequently do it in our organization. But look at verse, verse 7. It tells us this judgment is not for Israel's demise eternally, but to bring them to repentance. Because these harsh words that we read about in verses 4, 5, and 6, in verse 7 it says, it's a repetition, in that day of judgment, man will look concerning his maker. And his eyes to the Holy One of Israel will see. So verse 7 speaks about a change. Verse 8. And, and not longer, this is the implication, that he will not look to the altars. Now, when we say altar, mizbachot in the plural, we're, we're not talking about the bronze altar that was in the courtyard and the incense altar. We're not speaking about those. When the term mizbachot, altars, are used in such a reference, we're speaking about idolatry and it speaks about a change that this judgment and this is the purpose of a time of trouble for Jacob it's all to bring Jacob that is Israel the Jewish people in the last days to repentance so there's hope there is a prophetic promise here that that he will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, which he did with his fingers, meaning he created it for his purposes and his idolatry. He will not look at it, nor the Asherah. These are pagan uh, uh, idolatry gods or the Chamanim. Chamanim are the pillars that were erected in honor of the, the word cham is hot and it can relate to the sun. So the Asherah and the sun god worship. He won't any longer look to these things. There's going to be a change. Verse 9, the third time we see this expression, Be'yom ha'hu, on that day, their cities or the cities of his stronghold, they will be abandoned as a, a woodland. Now, he's talking once more that this judgment is going to be harsh. We see the purpose of it, but now he's returning back for the reader to understand the severity of it. That even though it's going to have a good outcome, it is going to be a very thorough day of judgment, and day here is a allotment of time so the cities of his stronghold meaning his fortified cities they are going to be abandoned as the Koresh this is the the uh, woodlands the the areas that's not fit for habitation and the treetops are going to be to be abandoned 
as from before the children of Israel, they will be desolate. And what it speaks of here when it says the treetops, speaking about the best places. And it's a, a reference to when the children of Israel entered into the land, they received. The enemy was defeated. The enemy fled or was defeated in war, wiped out. And what they had achieved, these cities, these homes, these kingdoms of the, the Gentiles, the Canaanites and such, who inhabited them? The children of Israel. So all of these chief places, these good places that God gave to them, he is going to make them, it says here, ve'haita shemimot. And it will, these chief places will become a desolation. Why? Why is all of this happening, this destruction? Verse 10 makes it very clear. No secret about it. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation. They have forgotten the one who gives true prosperity, true salvation, victory. And, and it continues on, that same word to forget, you have forgotten as well the, the rock of your power. And here, rock, that can be thought of the foundation of your power. Many people point out that this term rock relates also to Messiah. They have forgotten that messianic hope. You have not remembered him. So you've forgotten the God of your salvation and the rock of your power you have not remembered. Now, this is important because oftentimes prophecy is poetic. And what's the chief characteristic of Hebrew poetry? The answer is parallelism. And parallelism, parallelism teaches us things that are, are one. We use synonyms and language that reveals information to us. And here we find that there's a parallelism between, between the God of your salvation and the rock of your power. And who is this rock? It's Messiah. So it shows a parallelism, a unity, a, a, a oneness between God the Father and God the Son. When it says you have not remembered, it also speaks about forgetting the covenantal promises of God. And what was the manifestation? What showed that they forgot and they did not remember? Well, look at the second part of verse 11. It talks about how you have planted uh, trees, pleasant trees, and, and shoots, meaning twigs you have planted. But what type? You have sown, you have uh, planted trees of czar. Czar is foreign. So in other words, these foreign trees were part of, and we know this, they were part of a pagan worship. So instead of building up a kingdom rooted in the promises of God, the covenantal truth of God, instead of that, they, they sowed, they planted trees that were pleasant to them, that were pleasant, and the idea here is of the world's imaginations, the world's perspective. And all of this led to idolatry, verse, verse 11. In the day of your planting, it says, it flourished. And in the morning, your seed, it, it blossomed. And there was a mound for the harvest. So this is what I'm speaking about, that they were disobedient, but their disobedience did not immediately lead to punishment. They were prosperous for a season. There was great success as an outcome from their perspective of idolatry. Things were going well. There was a mound. There was a great harvest. What it says here, Ned Katsir, a, an abundance, a mound of the harvest. But what happened? In the daytime, it became sick or weak or it lessened. 
it waned. And also, it says there was human pain. So even though for a moment it looked good, it all diminished. And the outcome was it brought about human suffering, human pain. Verse verse 12. In verses 12 and 13, there's the depiction of the exile. These armies, these nations coming from afar in order to bring judgment for God. Not that they were doing it in obedience to him. They were doing it for their own evil purposes. And Assyria, Ashur, was a, a, a confederacy of many nations that they had conquered, and now they were working as one. Look at verse 12. Hoy. This is a word of attention. But it's also a word that, that, that elicits a bad thought. How awful. And it says, Hamon Amin Rabin. Now, this is not uh, good grammar for modern Hebrew. This is biblical Hebrew. And the reason why I say it is the word Hamon speaks of a great multitude. So if you say Hamon Amin, you're saying a multitude of peoples. So you would never say in, in modern Hebrew, Hamon, Amim, Rabim, because it's highly redundant. The word Rabim is many. So many peoples, many, as you can see, it doesn't make sense. But when we see something that doesn't make sense, this is where the wisdom is. This is the message. So a multitude of many peoples, and they are going to be, and the word here is like humming, but humming is not in this case for a song, but it's a sound. It's a sound that speaks of the nations coming. It's like a, a sea that hums or roars might be another word for, for translating it. It says, the sha'on, here sha'on, is not a, a watch, but it's also a noise, a noise of nations. And this is a synonym, it's parallelism. We have the word amim for people, and now that we have the word leumim for nations. As a noise of waters, what type of waters? The noise of strong waters that, that they roar. They are a violent noise. And this is what is going to happen to the northern kingdom. There is going to be a vast confederacy under Ashur, Assyria, that is going to come and they're going to make a great noise, a great disturbance, as they put the children of Israel, those northern tribes, into exile. And then we see verse 13. For the nations, as the roar of many waters, they will roar. So it's redundant. It says it again. And he will rebuke him, and they will flee from afar. This speaks of this exile, that God's rebuking these northern tribes, this northern kingdom called Israel. And this rebuke is going to cause them to flee to a distant. And notice that the enemy is going to pursue them, it says here. Or that they are going to be driven as a, a chaff is driven on the mountains before a wind. And a gargal, a gargal is like a will, but in this case, it's speaking like a, a tumbleweed. In Israel today, we see sometimes that a ball will be made of like uh, thorns and such, and the wind will blow it away. So these tumblewinds are driven before a, a tornado. Verse 14, our last verse. In the time of the evening, behold, there's going to be fear. And before the morning, there's not going to be, meaning everything's going to be destroyed. 
For this is the portion of the ones that loot, that they are going to experience looting, are looting, and the fate of our plunder. So the northern kingdom is going to be looted, our looting, and our plundering. That's the fate of idolatry. That's what this passage is trying to communicate to us. That when we are not faithful to God, the outcome is destruction. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.